All right, my friends, welcome back to the studio. I am once again inside today with the snow falling, the wind whipping and being as chill than ever, uh, right to the core out here in the Maritimes, but you can see I'm in the mood. I've got my track suit open, I've got my sunglasses on, basking in the ray of the halo light. What do you think of my, my pupils there? Hello. <laughs> All right, my friends, we're going to go see what's on the bench. You guys are here for some building because it is time for building when you are getting ready for the warm weather to arrive. Boom, there we go. Magic of TV, my friends. We are with the silver bullet on the bench. Last time I left you with my axial rift build, ba -ba! I had built the cage, I had installed the front axial or front axle from Vanquish. Uh, this is the all aluminum axle I had purchased. It is absolutely beautiful, uh, very light, very smooth. I know that doesn't mean anything to you guys right now, but you'll see in the future. This is my Reefs RC Raw 500 servo it's my steering servo i also now have mounted up the uh Intigy msr10 shocks like i said this is one of the only Intigy products i really endorsed over the years i love these shocks some people don't but that's the beauty of personal opinion you'll notice what you'll say what why is it installed upside down why are all of your shocks installed upside down there are two purposes for this the main purpose uh, for this build would be because in the rear, if I'm running a dual shock setup like I am here, you'll see that here's the sway bar mount. That's actually molded into the cage. And to get up to those shock points, if I had this shock body flipped up, it would actually be uh, bumping into it because I'm not gonna run the sway bar. But the real reason why I do this, the, the, the more important reason to me is to keep all the weight down low. For those that was already commenting that, you guys all get a cookie right now because that, <laughs> that was the right answer. This is uh, keeping all that weight down low. Instead of having them flipped up and having six shocks with all that high center of gravity, now it keeps everything down below. The other thing the people that were following along on my build may have noticed I went ahead and did, apart from installing the shocks, is installing these rear uh, lower suspension arms as well as da -da, there is the rear vanquish axle uh, housing and axles on the inside look at this beautiful piece of aluminum super light super sexy can access uh, the inside differential. I greased all the bearings. Uh, everything's new on the inside, including the axles. Uh, I went with the uh, 4313 pinion and spool gear on the inside, the Vanquish ones. I also did the uh, differential locker on the front and on the rear uh, axles. This is gonna make all four of my tires under power at all times, uh, which would make it a little bit wider on the steering. Of course, I could put rear steer in. I'm not gonna actually bother. Uh, I, I, I like to drive without rear steer. It could be cooler, I know, uh, and there's some folks out there that have done that, and all the power to them, that's the beauty of making your RCs your own. You'll see ba -ba, that I took the cover off of the transmission and the motor, and there is the center differential a lot of people that have the rift you know a lot of folks that have rcs are afraid to rip into them and they don't know that you know maybe their rc actually has a third differential in there today i'm going to go ahead and put that locker into the center as well as putting in the two speed transmission conversion which means not only am i going to be able to keep the original uh, motor and esc which i actually think is pretty bomb it works very very well and although it's not the best for crawling when you put in the two-speed transmission it's definitely going to make a huge difference plus I don't have to dump a whole lot of money into it because this is really a huge heart and soul of this machine already okay so remove the cage remove the bottom transmission plate remove the shocks and remove the transmission from the plate itself then remove the ESC the speed controller remove the front cover from the spur gear and pinion look at how beefy that is that's a 17 tooth huge pinion on that metal spur 
And then, of course, the center differential on the inside there is what we're going to be having a look at with the locker. But here, I have laid out the two-speed transmission for you guys to have a look at. Here's the shifting fork. Here's the spring. I'm imagining that this is going to go with the servo saver. And then the actual transmission itself. Here's the dogs and then the gear. So I'm going to rip in basically into this whole thing. First thing I got to do is remove the motor. It's pretty simple. Here and here it also looks like I'll have to remove the uh, the pinion before I can actually remove the motor. So I'm going to go ahead and do that and disassemble this so we can jump right into this upgrade. As a side note, one of the things I've noted about my Rift, and it was one of the first ones off and out of there, is that they used a lot of thread lock. In fact, when I was trying to remove this bottom screw, I actually ended up stripping it out because of the, the screw itself was kind of soft. But as you can see, there is a ton of thread lock on there. So you may want to heat up those screws before you do anything with your soldering gun, soldering iron, whatever you're using. Maybe a small torch, but because it is all metal, but not don't keep it on there too long just long enough to melt the thread lock okay and I undid the set screw I'm just going to use my needle nose to get that pinion off and then I should be able to slide the motor out no problem giving me access now here I'm spinning it I'm interested because my rift actually had a clicking noise to it after a while I thought it was the rear differential it was not I'm wondering if it's in here all right, turning it around, you can see that I've got several screws that have to be removed, uh, top and side and bottom. And then here is a small, um, small covering or a plate. I'm going to remove this because this, I believe, is where the shifting rod goes for the uh, micro servo that sits right here. I've got a metal gear servo. I'm going to drop in there. Uh, it's a little bit blue because I use acrylic conformal coating uh, to waterproof things. Now, I did not 100% waterproof this servo. Uh, I just opened it up and sprayed the small microchip that was on the inside and then on the outside gave it a water resist resistive coating. Uh, you can also put some marine grease up around the bearing or you can just buy yourself a waterproof uh, uh, servo. I didn't have a Reefs RC uh, micro servo on me. I'll probably order one of those in this. In in the future but at least I've got one of these on hand that I can use that's that's a high torque um, servo for this application I could have used the horizon hobby one but I think they're kind of weak Okay, so let's have a look at two of these things here. Now, if I was doing just the two-speed uh, conversion, I'd be looking at this top shaft that's actually connected to the outside spur gear. But I'm also replacing the inside differential with that Vanquish locker. Now, what does a differential do? It basically provides slip. And this is giving slip when either the front or the rear um, has traction. The other one is basically slipping. If I, print, if, if I say that right. Other people may say other things, but to keep it simple, that's the way it goes. Um, so for me, what I want to do is actually remove all the planetary gears in here, the spider gears. Some people would lock them up so that both sides turn at the same speed um, with some sort of like weld job or, you know, like silly putty or something like that. And that's basically what I'm going to do today, except with a solid piece called a locker. A lot of people are familiar with these. Uh, a lot of people aren't. But this basically removes any of the slip and keeps both of the axles turning at the same speed. So front and back would be turning under power at all times. So for this to be successful, just like in the um, axles that I did, I want to remove those four screws, remove the diff cup altogether, and then put the locker in place. There you go, just one solid piece that's going to get screwed to this outside gear right here. This now becomes a solid piece. You can see that there's no part moving here. It's all screwed together. And here was what was behind that diff cup. It was one large gear and then a bunch of little gears in there. 
that help provide slip. Now I don't see any broken teeth in there to where I thought it was clicking so maybe I was actually just getting some torque on the plastic diff cup and that was causing the clicking noise to occur. So nothing was actually broken so that's pretty decent. I thought for sure the torque of this machine had busted it out. Now that can be replaced and I'll get to that in a second but now I need to go ahead and remove this top shaft so I remove the spur gear, the giant gear and just go ahead and gently take that off and then I'm going to slide out this whole top shaft. That's what she said. <laughs> uh, now I get to rebuild the shaft the way it wants in the instruction book. So I'm going to go ahead and disassemble it and then remake the new one. It is at exactly this moment where I feel compelled to tell you about using a good waterproof grease. Uh, if you guys are working with bearings and if you love seeing your RC in the water or if you're like a Labrador retriever, uh, when you see water and you gotta go in it, like me, you're gonna wanna protect your bearings. Now all these bearings, even though they look like they're enclosed and sealed, it always helps to have a large amount of grease put into where you're gonna seat them and where you're gonna be using them. Because if water gets into your rig, it's gonna definitely get into the bearings and this is where you normally run into friction problems is when the bearings start to seize. Even in some of these waterproof trucks, as they say, the bearings are never truly safe. So I'd rather see you uh, slather them in grease like it's Friday night and you don't have a date and then you're better off safe than sorry with too much grease than not having enough right because it's better when it's slippery and not dry I can hear the wind howling outside I'm sure you guys can too but I'll be greasing everything every single bearing both the front and back side of it uh, just to ensure that everything goes according to plan in the future utter butter from calrc.com all right, so when it is together, you can see how there is the center dogs and they would shift back and forth to first and second gear or first and second gear, All right? They move back and forth. That's how they engage each gear. So now I'm gonna have the shifting fork, which we mentioned earlier, which is this doohickey right here. We're gonna have it go right in the center and this is what's gonna get shifting it back and forth. Okay, so now comes that second shaft, which is right here. It's going to get another gear on it, it looks like. And I can go ahead and replace that other locked differential now. And if you're building along with me, just so you want to see the final product, here it is. Locker installed, the two top rods installed, the shifting fork is installed. Now all I have to do is couple the transmission back together. All right, so here it is together and there is that shaft sticking out. This is what the shifting fork is actually attached to and you can see it slides in and out fairly easy there. Now I did run into an issue on the inside. You remember this pin right here? We all had a good look at this and it was located right beside this shifting uh, uh, pin. This actually is causing a bit of a binding on this. And so when I remove it, I didn't really think it was a necessary part because of how this is already mounted in. And although it might wear out over time, it's going to be shifting a lot more easy and taking the stress off of that servo I'm about to use uh, because of how it actually does the shifting. On this rod, even though it was all greased up, it did not work. So you might find that if you're doing this, I'll let you know if it breaks in the future. Just place the servo in there. How's that spacing? That's interesting. Let's check the book. Mm -hmm. You piece of shit. Look at this. I'm putting together the servo horn and then that piece says included with servo. So this piece right here is supposed to be with the servo that goes through the rest of the assembly, which forces you into buying one of those Horizon servos. That is bullshit. Look at how this is set up. You have to build this arm that goes up top. So this is like basically where this is supposed to go is a servo saver, and this is supposed to go on top of the servo saver and then this kind of moves this arm back and forth. But if you don't use a Horizon servo, it doesn't come with the adapter. Hilarious. 
Okay, so I'm gonna go with the original setup even though I don't have the piece for the uh, servo itself. Here is my servo machine where I'm actually just showing the center of the servo before it gets all hooked up so I can change it. It runs through, it runs through um, an auto setting, manual or neutral, and all it's doing is centering those uh, splines. So the shifter moves in and out like this on this top collar. And the reason why this is so frustrating is because you must use this servo horn to a degree. Uh, this is, you can see that this long slot actually gives it room to actually maneuver as it moves forward and backward as this turns on the servo itself. So I modified one of the servo horns that came with my micro servo. This was a long cross uh, servo horn. I clipped one side off completely, then I hobbled the other side. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put that into the neutral position, fly that back, and then put that on here. I went and took this servo horn here and I actually used some sandpaper and sanded off the front part of the servo saver right in here. So it still has this back lip that's going to go on over, basically over that T section as the wind howls away in the background. I'll just show you with this. I'll have to calibrate it in a moment here. But it goes over like that. That way I can still cinch it down with the spring. I can still cinch it down uh, with the uh, screw that it came with as my color gets all messed up there. But you guys get the idea. I'll show you shifting what I'm doing manually right here. You can see it's shifting it back and forth. Now that everything's together, I'm just going to turn it manually to make sure that my output drives on both sides are functioning. And then when I shift the gears, does it also function? It does. So then I know I'm good to install it back into the vehicle. So after some finagling, I've got everything uh, remounted up to the uh, mounting plate on the bottom. Uh, I also have the ESC plugged into the radio and I've already got it bound to my FlySky GT5 uh, six channel radio. Now I don't need all six channels. In fact, for now, I only really need three channels. One for throttle, one for steering, and of course one for the shifting servo. Now let's go back down to that shifting servo. I took the horn off because I want to explain Explain something to you guys for those that come here for tips and tricks. This servo, as you saw, I used the centering machine to make sure it was in the centered position. When this is in rest, this is the transmission shifting arm, when this is at rest, when the servo is not working, this should be in gear. Let's just say low gear for sake of argument. When I turn on the radio and I want it to go into high gear, I want the servo only to move a very small amount. It doesn't need a full throw on that arm because this can go quite a distance as it moves back and forth. If it tries to pull too much, the motor inside the servo will get hot, eventually it will fail, and this will be one of the weak points in your system. So what do we do to avoid this overthrowing in either direction? Like when it goes back to neutral, how does it know to stop right there? That has to do with the end point adjustment in your radio. Look at this. EPA I've got uh, highlighted there, end point adjustment. Now in this uh, receiver, I've got that servo for shifting hooked up to, uh, just for you know lack of better terms, channel number five, which is this uh, dial up here. Now I'm gonna put that right in the center. You'll see it says channel five right there, channel six beside, that's null and void right now. This one is right in the center. Well, if I'm going to change the endpoint adjustment for uh, auxiliary 5, I'm going to need to change or go to EPA and then go to number 5. You'll see I've already zeroed it out to 0% when it's going back to the original resting position. Because if it was at any higher than that, then when it returns, it will start pushing it too far and overwork the motor. So I adjusted it down to 0%. Now if I was going to change the other side to the maximum throw, I would change that to 100. But because I know that I don't want it to go all the way out, I just need it very small, I'm going to adjust that number to maybe, I'm going to just guess at 
30%. That's how far I want that servo to move in one direction. Okay, let's go ahead and check the end points here. So this is in the neutral position. Enter gate, uh, stage one, back to neutral, stage two. If you can't find them, grind them. I'm happy with that. You'll see that the endpoints are now limited to a very small throw. Let's check that servo up front because that's the Reef's RAW 500. Listen to this. Smooth like butter. So sexy. Let's see here. Now, when I first started this project, I went over some tire choices, and I showed what I actually had for tires in a choice at that time. And what you're looking at here is not my albeit tire of choice. In fact, no, no. But this was a very smart purchase. These are the Proline Badland tires. They're actually belted. What's that going to do? It's going to stop it from expanding very large and turning into what I would call a pizza cutter or like a circular saw blade where it just kind of deforms. That's something I really wanted. But upon the advice of everybody else, they said, no, no, no. Get ready for a USD sticky. Ha 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 ha. Look at this. A USD sticky, my friends. Is that an unbelievable tire from Ot6? Look at the giant, giant tread pattern on there. Also, the aluminum ring beadlocks I have on there from Locked Up RC. 2.2 size. I'm going to use the Vanquish offsets here. These are the hex adapters, but I still have to get my screws in for these offsets. So for the time being, these small badlands are going to have to do. Plus I need to get in some extra screws for these beadlocks because they uh, allow water in through those holes or breathability if that's what you're looking for. These actually are on the inside of the tire. Check this out. Look at this. Look at the ribs on the inside. I was considering taping these so they wouldn't expand, but these actually come in two different uh, firmnesses. Uh, if you want and you're going to use high speed like I am, it comes in a, in a very more hard uh, compound instead of a very soft compound. So regardless, I'm still going to be able to use those in the future. -hoo -hoo. She's going to hang nicely. Got to be crawling gear. <laughs> oh yeah! <laughs> what a huge difference. Back to crawling gear. The droop on that suspension. <clears throat> like a brick. I would never say there is one tire for all terrain. I would say it depends on the terrain, the type of weather that you have, the type of budget you have. Look at this. What a monster looking machine, my friends. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you want to get more updates on this project, of course, you already know what to do. You're on YouTube. You've been here before. Maybe leave me a comment. What do you think on this project, the silver bullet?